Greetings, everyone. This is Carlos Garrido welcoming you to another interview hosted by the Midwestern Marx Institute for Marxist Theory and Political Analysis. I am joined today by my fellow editor, Edward Smith. I'm also sorry to inform that Midwestern Marx editor, Noah Krashvik, who helped with the questions and was scheduled as an interviewer, had an emergency intervene and will be unable to attend. He has asked me to extend an apology to our special guest, Professor Grover Fur, whom he was greatly looking forward to meeting and hopes to meet when we have the professor back on in the future. Today we will be dealing with the life and legacy of Joseph Stalin, a topic that is very sensitive to many. The dominant capitalist world is built on top of a house of cards, from myths like those of primitive accumulation to myths regarding the central figures in the 20th century communist movement, the foundation of our hegemonic order crumbles a bit more when our search for truth unmasks, as our friend Ramiro would say, the spells of these wizards of propaganda have cast it. The great apostle of the Cuban revolution, Jose Marti, once said that a lie may last a hundred years, but the truth can reach it in any minute. In today's segment, we hope to supply the minutes in which truth conquers over lies, in which reason conquers over politically blinding irrationality. With this, I will now turn to Eddie for the introduction of Professor Fur. Thank you. Professor Grover Fur has been interested in the history of the Soviet Union during the Stalin period since the 1960s. Since 2005, he has published more than a dozen scholarly books and numerous articles in which he examines allegations of crimes or misdeeds by Joseph Stalin. He has discovered that not a single accusation of a crime by Stalin can be fully supported by evidence and that most allegations can be disproven by evidence. Grover Fur is also a professor of literature in the English department at Montclair State University. Thank you. Thank you for coming on, Professor. Um, we would like to start with our first question. Uh, sure. in, the, in, in the introduction to a lot of your work, you mention a phenomenon within the academy referred to as the anti-Stalin paradigm. To sort of kick it off here, could you explain what this anti-Stalin paradigm is and not only how it affects academics working in and out of topics related to Soviet history, working class history and historiography, but also how it affects what regular non-academic people are exposed to? Uh, sure. Can you hear me? Is this good? Yes. Okay. Briefly, uh, I coined the term anti-Stalin paradigm to describe the phenomena that I noticed uh, when I began to publish on uh, Soviet history of the Stalin period. Uh, what it means is that uh, it is uh, in mainstream, legitimated academic historical circles, not only in the United States, but abroad, uh, and even to a great degree uh, uh, in Russia itself, it is considered illegitimate to question uh, whether Stalin actually committed the crimes that he is accused of. And it is also considered illegitimate or in extremely bad taste to uh, adduce evidence to disprove any of the uh, accusations of crimes or misdeeds that Stalin uh, is alleged to have committed. And that means that the only thing that you read in legitimated mainstream historical so, uh, research and secondary sources uh, are either a repetition of unsubstantiated charges of the crimes, mass murders, repression, and so forth uh, by Stalin, or uh, the, the whole issue is avoided altogether. Uh, but you do not get uh, any attempt to prove uh, with primary source evidence uh, any of the uh, alleged crimes that are alleged against Stalin. So uh, my specialty has been looking uh, for the primary source evidence uh, in the case of these allegations of crimes by Stalin. Uh, and what I've discovered is that uh, so far, uh, and I've investigated a great many such allegations. So far, there is no primary source of evidence to support them. That is to say, the demonization of Stalin uh, is uh, a fraud. Interesting. 
I think one of your better known books, and I saw someone mentioning it in the comments already, is Khrushchev Lied. Yes. Uh, it's definitely what got us into your work. Um, so I'm not going to ask you to go into all of the various lies that you detail in your book here. Yeah. Although the book does cover them all pretty well. Um, the question we're interested in asking here is why, um, why do you think Khrushchev did this? Um, and did you think Khrushchev was planning de-Stalinization even before Stalin's death? Um, and Khrushchev's election as the first secretary of the CPSU? It looks like he was, of course, Khrushchev, uh, neither Khrushchev nor any of his close associates ever, um, stated outright precisely, um, why he um, gave that secret speech in February 1956 to the 20th Party Congress in which he attacked Stalin and accused him of all kinds of crimes. Um, and, um, and then uh, after uh, a certain period of time, after a few years, uh, uh, then accelerated uh, his attacks on Stalin and, uh, and uh, encouraged uh, many, many writers and uh, pseudo historians to write books and articles accusing Stalin of being a great historian. So Khrushchev never admitted, of course, that that he was falsifying, and uh, and and therefore claimed really that he was standing up for the truth. Uh, but since we know he wasn't, since I wrote that book and saw that, uh, in fact, none of these charges that Khrushchev leveled against Stalin. Could be supported by evidence. Um, the question naturally arises: Why did Why did he do it? And I, I mentioned this. I, I discussed it very briefly at the end of Khrushchev Live with some explanations. Uh, certainly, there was um, a lot of disagreement with Stalin's politics in the leadership among the leaders of the Soviet Communist Party by the time. Uh, Stalin died, and and for some years before that, uh, that's that's clear from a number of of, uh, of things. Um, one example would be the 19th Party Congress in October 1952, which was organized basically as uh, the next step, you know, preparing for the next step towards communism, towards communist society, and the the featured book. Of that Congress was Stalin's work on economic and uh, uh, problems of socialism in the Soviet Union, which was, uh, you know, discussed broadly and praised, of course, and was in a way the centerpiece of the Congress. Uh, no sooner did Stalin die five months later, in March 1953, but that the um, his book became no longer mentioned, no longer. Discussed. Uh, the resolutions uh, taken, or a number of the resolutions taken at the uh, Central Committee meeting in October 1952, which came right after the Party Congress, as they normally did, um, were ignored, uh, were simply uh, forgotten about, uh, and uh, and that was never acknowledged. And the transcript of that of that Congress. Uh, has never been published. So clearly, this uh, attack on Stalin uh, was preceded by or accompanied by um, significant disagreement uh, with 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 the way that socialism in the Soviet Union was being developed uh, under Stalin's leadership. And I mentioned a few possibilities. Uh, the answer. Is we don't have a, a, a solid uh, answer. Um, I did write a, a two-part article in 2005 called "Stalin: The Struggle for Democratic Reform," where I discussed the evidence that uh, Stalin wanted to get the, um, the Communist Party uh, out of um, directly governing the country uh, and uh, return it back to perhaps. Uh, its original function of uh, ideological struggle uh, and uh, winning people to the ideals of communism. Uh, I discussed that there, and uh, there's there's some evidence for that. Uh, but I but I think that 
or whatever, however you want to identify the causes of Khrushchev's behavior, they must go uh, deep into the history of the Communist Party, not, in, not only the 40s, but back into the 30s and perhaps even beyond that. I'm afraid I can't be more definite than that because we just don't know. If this were the United States, if this were many other countries in the world, uh, this problem would have been uh, aggressively researched or at least aggressively attacked, approached by, by historians, both professional and amateur. But that has never happened in Russia. Yeah, even though we don't know, um, I think that article about Stalin seeking democratic reform is still really, really interesting. Um, and I brought that up to a handful of people. Sure. Um, because, I mean, that in itself kind of debunks a lot of the narratives about Stalin as this authoritarian, you know. Yeah, um, yeah. For sure. So that said, uh, there are certain narratives going around that Khrushchev was involved in Stalin's death. Um, is there any weight to these narratives or any chance that that's possible? Well, there's a lot of rumors going around. Um, <laughs> there, I haven't spent a lot of time. I've read about that, of course. I haven't spent a lot of time trying to get to the bottom of that. Um, uh, everybody dies at some point. Stalin was not in good health, uh, and um, so I think what is really important uh, to us today uh, is, uh, you know, the, the 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 changes that took place, the the political uh, context, uh, and uh, and how the politics of the Soviet Union uh, changed as a result of Stalin's death. Uh, it, it seems likely that uh, at least um, medical attention wasn't called to Stalin after he had his stroke uh, for maybe 24 hours or so, uh, whether that it, it's not clear exactly why that was. Uh, so I don't, I don't want to exaggerate the, the importance of, of, uh, of that issue. Uh, but concentrate on the uh, I prefer to concentrate on the uh, the uh, historical and political uh, results uh, of of Stalin's death. Right, and I I think that um, a lot of these myths are like interconnected, and yeah. uh, through that interconnection, it helps uh, the belief of other myths. And one of the big okay. myths. Uh, that we believe in the West is that there was no such thing as debate uh, sure. in the Soviet Union. And that helps to to reinforce that narrative uh, that uh, some of the lies couldn't have been politically motivated because mm -hmm. that would imply debates and, and factionalization within the party. And the idea is that, no, there was just this one homogenous mass, mm -hmm. what we call Soviet Marxism today in the West. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so... Uh, the next question, um, before mm -hmm. the Khrushchev era, Stalin was obviously pursuing various policy agendas, especially regarding democratic reforms and the political and Marxist education of the party officials. Mm -hmm. If I recall correctly, this was a big criticism of Khrushchev, namely that he was not using Marxism to inform his decision making and was very loosely letting all sorts of people into the party. And it wasn't just Khrushchev either, obviously. So what programs did Stalin propose to counteract this sort of thing? I don't think that that criticism is, uh, was made by Khrushchev, certainly not in his secret speech. Um, it was made by Trotsky uh, in the late 20s and particularly in the 1930s because, uh, well, of course, Trotsky and his supporters uh, were voted out, and his policies, the policies that he and his supporters supported, uh, were voted down in the various party congresses in the 1920s. And uh, Trotsky attempted to explain this by saying that that uh, after Lenin's death, uh, Stalin uh, had permitted uh, all kinds of, of uh, politically naive and untrained people to join the party. Uh, there was a big uh, push to uh, uh, people from the working class, for example, uh, and and you know Trotsky was essentially saying these people were either too ignorant to understand uh, his Trotsky's proposals or uh, voted with uh, with uh, 
the Stalin party because uh, for, for careerist reasons. So that, that was that was what Trotsky uh, alleged in the late 20s and the early, I don't remember that Khrushchev uh, particularly said that. Um, I think that um, maybe on the other hand, you could take a look at the size of the Communist Party and wonder whether all of these people, uh, most of whom are recent party members, had really mastered uh, even the elements of, of Marxism, or as it was called then, and we tend to call it today, Marxism-Leninism. Uh, Stalin was very concerned about the low ideological level of party members, and um, I'm not going to go into the uh, steps that he attempted to take to, to uh, deal with that question um, right now. Uh, you can ask me to. But uh, but he was very concerned about that. He tended to see that that was a, a very uh, it was a crucial issue that uh, party leaders, party officials on all levels should uh, should uh, uh, increase uh, their education in uh, in Marxism. Just to be clear, because I I think I worded it kind of ambiguously when I said uh, a criticism of Khrushchev. I didn't mean that he uh, levied the criticism, but that it was levied against him. Oh, um, yes. Sure. Okay. Uh, sure. Roger, sure. Roger sure. Keery and Thomas Kenny, they yeah. mentioned when socialism betrayed. So that's... Yeah. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Chris Jett was, I guess there, there are, is a, a fair amount of evidence that Chris Jett, uh was not uh, conversant with uh, Marxism, Leninism, certainly not with uh, dialectical materialism. And uh, and neither were any of his successors as first secretary uh, in the uh, in the Communist Party. But he wasn't the only one who wasn't who wasn't um, conversant with them. I think that was Stalin's. Uh, that was a big concern of Stalin. Uh, Stalin. Sponsored and paid a great deal of attention to the uh, drafting of the book, which we now call the History of the Communist Party, Soviet Union Short Course. Uh, and we know a great deal about the process of writing and then getting uh, mass comments from the Soviet, uh, Soviet citizens about its drafts. Uh, he also sponsored and paid a great deal of attention uh, a little later on. Encouraging the uh, the uh, drafting of the work that did not come out until after his death, called uh, 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 political political economy, a textbook of political economy. The book wasn't actually published until fifty five, but it was in dra it was being drafted for years before that. And, and Stalin uh, told one of people who was in charge of drafting it, that if we don't have this book to educate uh, our, our comrades, uh, educated people in the Soviet Union, we're not going to have comrades. So he saw that political education was extremely important. And uh, clearly, uh, it, it, didn't, it didn't take, and it, it, he was not successful in raising to the desired extent the, uh, the political level of the party leadership. That's very interesting because one of the one of the arguments you get, uh, more specifically from like social theorists, sociologists, philosophers mm -hmm. in the West, um, is about Soviet Marxism being mechanistic, um, and a lot of them like to trace this uh, lineage from like Engels to Stalin. But it's it's really Stalin, and it's mm -hmm. a politically motivated argument that sort of addresses itself up as a theoretical disagreement, but. Um, mm -hmm. Some of your work shows that there was quite uh, theoretical po poverty in some members in the party because of issues like, you know, for instance, Khrushchev just letting a bunch of people in and that this had to be combated. Um, and I, I think that textbook on the history of the uh, Communist Party of the Soviet Union, uh, the mm -hmm. text you mentioned on political economy, tried to do just that. And yeah. it's pretty strange to, uh, to find criticisms of, you know, these texts being simplistic or, or, or simplified when they're meant to educate people that have no base understanding 
in in Marxism. That's a it's a very strange thing because obviously knowledge is a, a a dialectical process of getting to know things more concretely. And people who had never engaged with Marxism had to start somewhere. And these textbooks are very good for that. Yeah, and that's what and that's what the the short course was designed to do. Right, uh, it was designed to be a kind of primer, you know, a kind of uh, a te elementary textbook to give a yeah. history of the party, a history of Marxism, a history of the party, and then a, and then a, 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 a general and, and rather schematic uh, introduction to Marxism. It is true that uh, for a number of reasons having to do with the, the nature of political struggle that took place uh, after Lenin became incapacitated by his illness in 1923 and then died. Sure. The nature of the political struggle was such that um, that a touchstone of political reliability became uh, the degree to which one agreed with uh, what Lenin had written. And, um, and I think that, that there are two sides to that. You know, Man, and he certainly uh, was more far seeing than uh, other Bolshevik leaders. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, uh, an atmosphere arose that, uh, that whatever Lenin wrote could not be questioned. And, um, and that, in the long run, proved to be uh, a negative factor. Uh, there was not sufficient discussion of, uh, of the history of the Bolshevik party and of the, perhaps uh, uh, some of the uh, uh, some of the contradictions within uh, the work of Lenin or even within uh, I wouldn't say that the accusation that Marxism, Soviet Marxism mechanism is entirely false, but it's uh, normally stated without any attempt to support it or to give examples of it. And that's that's that is to say, it's normally it's normally employed uh, for anti-communist purposes, and that's the problem. You're absolutely right, because you get any of these texts that uh, uh, are criticizing so what they call Soviet Marxism as just one yes. block of things, and you look for the sources, and and you know rarely do you find uh, many uh, sources from the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. um, Mary, many primary sources, they're just like citing each other. Um, yes. And it has become almost a, a ritual that in every preface to any yeah. book of the last 30, 40 years in the West on Marxism, you have to condemn Stalinism, right? This, this as what you call the anti-Stalin paradigm. And yeah. that, happen, that happens in, in theory as well. That's a, my field, I'm, I'm a philosopher and I, I see it happen all the time. And it's just, it's intellectual laziness that, uh, you know, if you can disagree with something, but mm -hmm. cite it and, and be professional about it and and flesh out your disagreements. I would love, you know, as a Marxist-Leninist philosopher to be able to engage with actual disagreements grounded in, in actual research. And sure. a lot of the times I just don't find that because they don't cite anything. It's just these dogmatic beliefs that are passed on to them. And yeah. uh, the weird thing is that they point over there and say they're the dogmatists. And mm -hmm. <laughs> in, in the act of doing that, they're expressing the same dogmas that they have inherited for, for generations. Sure. Sure. Very often, I find most Marx, most Marxists that are, you know, the dismissive of Stalin, that are anti-Stalin, that are dismissive of, of the Bolshevik experience, are are right-wing Marxists who want to rescue Marx as some sort of some sort of genial philosopher. Uh, Lenin wrote about this in one of his books, uh, I think, the book on Kautsky, that uh, <clears throat> there's an attempt to benefit to turn Marx into a uh, kind of just another another philosopher instead of a, a, an advocate of a violent revolution, and um, and you can see that tendency in uh, in the uh, criti criticisms of the Soviet Union and the use of the term Stalinism, which by the way was invented by uh, by Trotsky and the Trotskyists, um, and. Um, and it's it's dismissive. It's an attempt to uh, discourage people from looking seriously at the history of the uh, Soviet Union and the Bolshevik Party uh, during Stalin's 
period and of, uh, of the accusations against Stalin and what Stalin actually did. Absolutely. And that serves as a good uh, segue to our follow-up on the uh, Khrushchev question. Um, the democratic reforms, one of our favorite papers you've ever written, you we, you mentioned it earlier, was uh, Stalin and the democratic struggle for, and the struggle for democratic reform. Yeah. Uh, it's one of the biggest myths about Stalin that seems to stick around so long after his death. Yeah. You know, Stalin was this evil dictator that took total power and would eat everyone's babies and their babies' babies if they didn't agree with him. I love the formulation of this question by Noah, by the way, <laughs> the babies eating baby stuff. Um, can you explain the gist of the plans for democratic reform for our audience and what happened to them? Very good. Um, in the early 1930s, first half of the 1930s, was Stalin and the Politburo, but I think Stalin was in the leadership here, uh, believed that uh, with uh, collectivization of agriculture being mainly complete, with industrialization um, well underway, the uh, 1924 uh, constitution of the Soviet Union uh, had been uh, outmoded and a new constitution was necessary. And there you know, there are a lot of interesting aspects to the draft of that constitution. But before the constitution was drafted, uh, he gave an interview to uh, Roy Howard, who is a, an American newspaper magnate. Uh, and uh, in that, he talked about how the new constitution would be very democratic and allow, among other things, uh, contested elections. Uh, and uh, persons who were not members of the Communist Party would be able to run for governmental posts. We're talking about the government here, not talking about the party, of course. Uh, and would be able to run, and there would be contested elections. Uh, communists would run, but non communists would also run. And there would be, uh, there would be voting along the lines that uh, is familiar in Western capitalist countries uh, universal, secret. Uh, balloting, uh, and that, uh, and and importantly, that uh, uh, all the e votes would be equal. That is to say, a vote uh, by a peasant would be uh, equal to a vote by the worker, and, and that was not true in the 1924 Constitution. The 1924 Constitution gave uh, many more uh, seats if you want, to uh, working class uh, constituencies than to uh, non-working class constituencies, particularly peasantry. So there were a number of things at work uh, in the proposal for the 1936 Constitution. Uh, one was to uh, have these contested elections, which would mean that the Communist Party was not nominating the uh, members of the government as had, in effect, been the case up until that time, and that non-communists could run for, for uh, offices and would be encouraged to do that. Uh, another is that uh, the concept of the dictatorship of the proletariat was largely abandoned. Uh, I mean, if peasants and middle-class people and workers all have uh, the same uh, the same weight in uh, determining who represents uh, the constituencies and the, and the, and the, on the various levels of the uh, legislative branches, the Soviets, right, the councils, uh, then uh, it seems like like the, the concept of the dictatorship of the proletariat is being uh, either eviscerated or perhaps abandoned altogether. Uh, Stalin and the party leadership close to him uh, wavered during the 1930s about uh, whether or not socialism had been achieved yet or was still yet to be achieved. Uh, that was really, really an undecided question. So uh, I think what most people carry away from that, those two articles that I wrote, that the first one deals with the, before World War II, the second one with developments after the Second World War, what most people carry away with it uh, 
uh, is a, uh, away from reading that article is that, oh my gosh, Stalin was all for democracy. Uh, very democracy as, as, as we recognize it uh, in the capitalist West. And that's true. Uh, that's what most people notice. But uh, I think we need to look more, uh, more carefully at some of these other issues, like the question of the dictatorship of the proletariat, uh, like the question of giving um, uh, uh, equal weight in terms of uh, voting for for uh, representatives, representatives to the legis to the legislative bodies of the Soviets, to uh, to uh, all parts of the population. Stalin also um, fought for the idea that those who had been disenfranchised, those who had lost the ability, the right to vote as a result of uh, being being opposed to Soviet power, uh, the kulaks, uh, certain kinds of political dissidents, um, certain certain criminals too were deprived of political rights for a certain period of time after their conviction. Uh, he wanted to uh, return the uh, political rights the, uh, to right, vote among other things, candidacy to these groups of people. And uh, many of the people in the party leadership uh, uh, thought that that was a, a dangerous thing to do. So, you know, that whole complex of, of uh, of issues uh, is involved in the uh, struggle for uh, democratic reform uh, in the mid 1930s in the Soviet Union. And by the way, uh, the um, Stalin argued strenuously at the party uh, conferences uh, that we know of uh, during the 30s, during the later part of the 30s, uh, for this, and so did his men. But uh, the Central Committee was not convinced. Uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, there was never a majority support in the Central Committee for uh, contested elections, for example. Uh, and uh, yeah, we, we know, thanks to the work of a certain Soviet history, Russian history, first Soviet and then Russian historian, Yuri Zhukov, who uh, read the documents, read the primary documents uh, years ago, that uh, it was uh, in the second week of October of 1937 that the Politburo um, uh, decided that uh, they would not have contested elections uh, that December, that contested elections would not take place, that, uh, that the, the most that would happen would be that uh, there would be a block of party and non-party candidates, uh, but that uh, Contested elections, as had been uh, foreseen, uh, and as has as was in the in the 1936 Constitution, often called the Stalin Constitution, uh, that these did not take place, and they never did take place. Thank you uh, for that answer. I guess I'll go into our next question then. Um, Two of the biggest blows to the international workers' movement of the 20th century um, were the dissolution of the Comintern or the Communist International, and then the Sino-Soviet split. Um, mm. So, could you give us your views on these um, and any insight you may have uh, into Stalin um, and uh, his part in the former, the dissolution of the Comintern? Sure. Well, the Comintern is a whole <laughs> part of it. it's an important uh, issue in and of itself. Um, it was an important and uh, earth-shaking idea. Um, it um, it was unsuccessful, uh, and, and the Soviets, of course, were unsuccessful in stopping the um, advent of fascism in Europe, uh, Mussolini, and especially. Hitler, but in other countries too, um, and uh, and the Soviet Union, by let's say 1939, uh, was facing uh, a an inevitable attack 
by fascist powers uh, without any allies, completely devoid of allies. It was completely encircled by hostile powers, uh, most of which ended up joining up with Hitler to invade the Soviet Union in 1941. So the Soviets tried to form what they called collective security, treaties with the, uh, the capitalist West who had their own antagonism to Hitler, that is with Britain and France. Uh, they were unsuccessful. The British and the French leadership did not want to, to, to do that. And had they wanted to do that, had they done that, it's uh, almost certain that there would not have been any World War II, and no Holocaust, and no tens of millions of deaths. But the British and the French refused to do that because, of course, they were highly anti communist and were, um, many of their leaders would have been very happy for Hitler to polish off the Soviet Union and, and uh, deal with the communist menace of suppression, much as he had, much as Hitler had done in Germany. Um, well, the Soviets were invaded, the Soviet Union was invaded in June 22nd, 1941. Uh, Germany and, uh, was already at war with uh, uh, Britain and France. Uh, and so um, the Soviets reached out to the British and the French, and particularly the British, of course, because France was the one that conquered, um, to form an alliance. And then uh, in December, uh, Hitler obliged the Soviets by declaring war on the United States, which brought the United States in on the war. And um, the Stalin leadership saw that that the, uh, the the aid or believed that the um, military uh, and material aid from the these capitalist forces, with whom they were now uh, allies of convenience, uh, would be essential to uh, either either essential to defeating the Nazis. Uh, and certainly essential in mitigating the tremendous suffering of the Soviet population uh, during in the war. Uh, the Western capitalist countries were very hostile towards the commentary, which meant the communist movements in their own countries. By this time, the communist movements in their own countries were basically supporting anyone, including their own governments, who would who would attack Hitler, who would ally with the Soviet Union. Uh, and as a and as the so as the common turn had not proven to be uh, any kind of, of strong bulwark against the rise of fascism, and as it was uh, very unpopular in the uh, Western capitalist countries, uh, uh, the the common turn leadership voted to uh, to Dissolve the Comintern. Now, Stalin did say at the time. We know from his uh, talks with Dimitrov, who had been the head of the Comintern, that they intended to revive it at a future time uh, after the war. But uh, but it, but it was done basically because it, it was more important to believe, thought to be more important. To unite all forces to defeat uh, the, to protect the homeland of, of socialism, Soviet Union, than to maintain uh, the common turn uh, in the Western uh, capitalist countries, uh, which who were basically he helping helping uh, their own countries, uh, uh, you know, join join the Soviet Union in the war, and which had. Which, which were an irritant to the capitalist states. Um, but the issue of the common turn deserves a study because um, uh, the idea is, is a, uh, seems to be you know, an exceptional, how could, you, how could you disagree with that from a communist point of view? But uh, it, it did not work out uh, in the historical context in which it existed. It did not work out to be uh, to to lead revolutions in other countries, with of course the exception of China, and so um, 
the Comintern did play a role, and the Soviet Union played a greater role, in uh, permitting the Chinese Communist Party to survive and to regroup after its defeats of the 1930s and eventually to take state power. So, uh, so the, the, the history of the common turn is more complicated than one might suspect. One, I, don't, I don't believe it would be right to say, well, the common turn should just have been preserved or the common turn should just have been dissolved and never revived. Uh, there was always the attempt, there was always the desire to, to, uh, have the, to bring back some version of the international communist movement. By the way, um, I put online some years ago some quotations from a book by a, by a leading American communist who uh, died a long time ago, but who wrote about the American Communist Party during this period of time. And uh, he transcribed in his book the um, two telegrams that, that he claimed that the Communist Party of the United States, Communist Party of the USA, had received from the uh, Communist Party of the Soviet Union, and secretly by telegram. By, uh, and these two statements are very interesting statements. And basically what they say is you should uh, try to learn from the Soviet experience, but not slavishly imitate it. You have to learn from your own experience. You have to, you have to uh, find your own path to uh, socialism. So that the... Uh, Despite the allegation that you hear that um, the Soviet Union was dictated to the top common turn and the communist parties of the common turn had no agency, had no independent, um, no independent uh, uh, policies, no, po no possibility of independent, uh, independent development, uh, that's just not true. Thank you for that. Um, and can you give some of your thoughts on the Sino-Soviet split? Because I've, I've heard before. well, I don't, I, I don't research that. As you know, that's that's well past the Stalin period. But let me say a couple of words about it. Okay, Khrushchev gave his secret speech, uh, February 1956, and of course this sh this shook the world without without exaggeration. Within a couple of years. Uh, Communist parties all over the world lost large numbers of their members, okay, because uh, Khrushchev basically said the communist movement had been led by a, by a murderous maniac for, for 30 years, which, of course, is the opposite of what uh, everybody had thought. And it was avidly picked up by the capitalists and the imperialists, and, of course, they, they propagandized it all over the place. Uh, the Chinese Communist Party uh, initially supported Khrushchev. Khrushchev was the leader of the world communist movement. You know, the Soviet Union was the lead in the leadership. Within about a year, the Communist Party leadership in China uh, issued, started issuing statements that uh, disagreed with the thrust of what the Soviet, what the Soviet Communist Party was saying, what Khrushchev was saying. Initially, they they did this by debating, by pretending to debate with the Italian Communist Party, which is a large Communist Party, which had gone along with Khrushchev. So they issued uh, some pamphlets. One was called The Differences Between Comrade Togliatti and Us. Uh, and another one was called More on the Differences with Comrade Togliatti and Us, between Comrade Togliatti and Us. But the differences were really not with Togliatti. The differences were really with the Soviets. And... Uh, and things went downhill from then. Um, the uh, Soviets had supplied material and expertise, engineers and scientists, technicians, and lots and lots of material help to, to build uh, all kinds of, of important industrial facilities in China. Uh, Khrushchev withdrew them at the end of the 1950s. He just, one day, he just gave the order. And Soviet experts uh, packed up and left, leaving these projects uh, semi semi completed or, or, or incomplete. Uh, there was a severe break, uh, and in, by the early 1960s, 
uh, the Chinese leadership, uh, evidently it was Mao and his close associates, uh, were writing uh, overt attacks on the Soviet uh, Communist Party's line. One such pamphlet, and there are a number of pamphlets in what's called the Sino-Soviet Dispute, is called on Khrushchev's phony communism and its lessons. I think it's lessons to the world, or anyway, on Khrushchev's phony communism and its lessons. And uh, they began to develop the, the, the idea that, uh, an interesting and important idea, that um, a communist movement must always be moving ahead, must always be developing towards greater and greater socialism. Uh, and Khrushchev had begun to uh, back away from some collectivist um, uh, policies that were uh, instituted during Stalin's period, uh, such as the state ownership of the machine tractor nations, for example, and there were others. Uh, and the Chinese began to suggest that that meant that Khrushchev's line attacking Stalin was a masquerade in some way of, uh, for, for his policies of turning away from developing uh, more and more towards socialism, all right? And, uh, and, 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 and a number of things. And, and that, that, of course, was a, a, a big issue in, in, in the World Communist Movement, it was a big issue in China. I mean, here's China breaking with the, you know, the acknowledged leader of the, uh, of the World Communist Movement, the Soviet Union. Uh, then in Beijing, in, I don't know, it was 64, 65, but at the same time that there's this attack on uh, what was described as the development towards capitalism, the abandonment of socialism by Khrushchev, uh, some, some forces, some leftist forces, beginning, I think, among the students, uh, started to see that there, there appeared to be similar processes um, going on in China. And to make a long story short, that was the start of what became the Cultural Revolution in China. And during the Cultural Revolution, Chinese Communist Party uh, leaders on various levels uh, who were thought, who were said uh, by the left-wingers to be abandoning uh, socialism were called Little Khrushchevs. Okay, little Khrushchevs, you're abandoning socialism like Khrushchev is doing. And so the Stalin's, uh, the, the Khrushchev's secret speech uh, was uh, Indirectly and not really so indirectly either, uh, responsible ultimately for the uh, Cultural Revolution in China, which was an attempt by left-wing forces uh, to stop, to put the brakes on developments within China, within socialist China, that they saw, that they interpreted as being similar to those that uh, the Chinese party leadership under Mao uh, was describing and was denouncing uh, in um, in the Soviet Union. That's wonderfully said. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, so on the topic of China, it's pretty well known that the Communist Party of China's view of Stalin is the 70-30 view. That is, Stalin was 70% good and 30% not so good. Domenico Lasordo seems to hold a similar view in his book, Stalin, the history and critique of a black legend. Mm -hmm. What about you? Uh, do you have any criticisms of Stalin for us? Okay. Um, the Chinese, as I just finished saying, the Chinese communist leadership uh, by the late 50s um, had realized, had recognized that Khrushchev had changed a number of policies in the Soviet Union, uh, which they regarded as deviations from Marxism Leninism. I mean, the most famous, of course, is Khrushchev declared that uh, the revolution was no longer necessary. The revolution in capitalist countries was no longer necessary for peaceful, 
for for socialism, reaching socialism uh, through peaceful competition, peaceful coexistence, and peaceful competition with capitalism. That's the title of one of his collections of Khrushchev's speeches, I think. Um, by the way, that was the first book back in the 1950s when I was a teenager. The first book that I actually bought after I got a little bit curious as to what the hell the Cold War was all about and what was what was the Soviet Union, what was going on in the Soviet Union, Stalin was already dead. I went out and bought this the collection of Khrushchev's speeches, and that's basically what it was for uh, for, for peaceful coexistence and uh, victory to socialism, you know, and peaceful competition with capitalism, something along those lines. Um, so, so the Chinese, um, uh, you know, saw that. And then went on to develop this critique of Khrushchev's policy. But what they didn't know was that Khrushchev was lying. Okay, they didn't know that all of these alleged crimes and alleged dictatorial and arbitrary acts by Stalin that are alleged in that secret speech of, uh, by Khrushchev in February 1956, they didn't know that these were lies. They didn't know that. Uh, we know it now, to, to be frank, thanks to the book that I wrote, right? I did the research and uh, and discovered that these were lies. I, I didn't know it beforehand either, uh, but they certainly didn't know it. So the 70-30 is based upon um, accepting the, the allegations uh, and the Accusations made by Khrushchev in that secret speech against Stalin. The, the Chinese didn't didn't have any way of refuting. They didn't question. And Mao has a couple of short essays. Or, uh, yeah, I guess they're essays. Uh, I haven't read them in a while. Uh, where he talks about Stalin and what Stalin did that was wrong. You know, he was arbitrary. He didn't consult the masses. He didn't consult the Party leaders, he tried to be a personal victim. But this is all based upon Khrushchev's and Khrushchev era Soviet slander of Stalin. And now we know that's wrong. So, uh, my view of, of, of that 70 30 statement is that uh, Mao made it with, uh, uh, made it under, uh, under conditions of ignorance. He could not have known that Khrushchev was basically lying and what he would have said if he had known Khrushchev was lying, uh, I'm, I'm sure it would have been very, very different. And just since you asked, um, I mentioned that that the uh, Cultural Revolution uh, can be uh, traced in, in, in some real way to uh, Chinese uh, criticism of, the, um, of Khrushchev's secret speech and then of Khrushchev's subsequent attacks on Stalin. Um, when, when Khrushchev gave that speech, China was in the process of following a path of, of development, agricultural and industrial development, very much like the Soviet Union had done. I mean, you could call it the Stalin formula. First of all, you collectivize agriculture, and that's what the Chinese did. Five and fifty-six, uh, and they did it in a very struggling way. Uh, and then you um, you industrialize, but you industrialize without foreign investment. Of course, the Chinese thought that they could rely on the Soviets to give them a lot of help, and for a period of time, the Soviets did give them that help. But basically, it was the same path. I mean, the Soviets industrialized without foreign development, without foreign investment, and then the Chinese, although with Soviet help, also we're in the process of industrializing without, without foreign investment. Um, and of course, that's a very, very difficult thing to do. But they were in the process of doing that, and there's no real reason to think that they would have failed uh, if, they had if they had pursued that path. But because of Khrushchev's stature in the world communist movement, and because of the support uh, within the Chinese Communist Party leadership, of the Soviet Union, uh, the Chinese really stopped. They really backed away from the original 
of a Stalin uh, attempt to uh, industrialize with one's own through one's own efforts without foreign investment. They did have uh, what's called the Great Leap Forward, which was an attempt to, to imitate the first five-year plans uh, the Soviet Union carried out. There was a severe famine, some uh, 58 through 61, something like that. The country differently, but it was a serious famine. It's been enormously uh, exaggerated in uh, anti-communist scholarship, uh, some anti-communist scholars say 40 million people or 45 million people died as a result of the, of the fan. There's good evidence that it was more like four to six million people, uh, which is a lot fewer, but it was still a serious fan. Okay. Uh, and, um, and as a result of the fan, and as a result of the, the Initial problems with the Great Leap Forward. Uh, there was a lot of opposition to what was then termed to be Mao Zedong's course for developing socialism, and uh, and it was uh, sidetracked to a greater or lesser extent. And that was also one of the uh, roots of the Cultural Revolution, which was uh, Mao's attempt to. Um, combat what he regarded, and rightly, I think, as, as right-wing forces within the Communist Party, the leadership of the Communist Party of China. So, uh, you know, if one wants to speculate about alternative histories, one could ask, well, suppose Khrushchev hadn't given that. Not only would the history of the Soviet Union have been very different, the history of the World Communist Movement had been very different, uh, but the history of, of China, uh, and the Chinese Communist Party would have been very, very different. Khrushchev's speech really as a uh, as a kind of cardinal point, a kind of kind of pivotal point uh, in not only in the history of the communist movement, but as a result in, in world history of the uh, 20th century. Thank you for that. Definitely. Um, and I'll ask the next next question in the spirit of Noah um, as best I can, because he wrote this one. Um, but he wanted to know about Trotsky. Um, mm. And he had just read uh, Trotsky's Amalgams. Um, I don't know if that's how it's pronounced, but okay. He did. Oh, good for him. That's a long <laughs> yeah. book. That's yeah. A long he said, book. Is it, he said it was fantastic. Um, okay. Okay. Well, got three more. <laughs> I think I think I've got three more books on Trotsky after that. Um, you know, Trotsky. Okay, so they did this. Let's just step back to the early, to about the year two thousand or so. Okay, uh, I was contacted by a wonderful guy, uh, Vladimir Bobrov in Moscow, who proposed that we work together uh, to to do a book on the. Tukhachevsky affair, the military conspiracy, the alleged military conspiracy. Uh, and he introduced me to the fact that that many documents from former Soviet archives were beginning to be published. And um, and and they were obviously very important. So I sat down and started to systematically gather, collect, and read them. And of course, more and more came out over time. And that's what led me to write Khrushchev Live. Because in the process of just reading documents and reading documents for a long period of time, I realized that uh, some of these documents gave evidence that uh, said said things that uh, you know said, th said one thing and Khrushchev said something else in that secret speech. So I went back and, and studied the secret speech, and then I ended up uh, writing that book Khrushchev Lied, based upon uh, the uh, evidence we now have from the former Soviet. Era. Archives, and of course, we have an awful lot more today than we had uh, back in 2005 when I was writing that book. Um, well, as a result of Khrushchev's secret speech, uh, Trotskyism worldwide uh, got a tremendous boost. Trotsky had been saying for decades, you know, Trotsky was murdered in 
important. But Trotsky had been saying since the 1920s that Leonard Stalin was a terrible guy and he was misleading uh, the communist movement and misleading the Bolshevik party and uh, was against Lenin. And ultimately, uh, during the 30s, uh, you know, Trotsky made all of the all of the accusations, the kinds of accusations that Khrushchev made against Stalin. He was a murderer, he was dishonest, he was killing people on the right, and, you know, slaughtering the real Marxists, the real Leninists, Trotskyists. Trotsky made a lot of these kinds of accusations, and it, it, it was not a surprise uh, that, that the Trotskyists saw in Khrushchev's secret speech a, um, a, a tacit um, Rehabilitation of Trotsky. In fact, um, we've known for the last 20 years or so that um, within a few days of Khrushchev giving that secret speech, Trotsky's widow, who was still alive in the West, Natalia Sedova, wrote, I believe it was to the Central Committee, but it was maybe it may have been to the Soviet government, uh, wrote to Soviet authorities and said, uh, "Well, now that you're attacking Stalin." Realize what a bad guy he was. Uh, you should rehabilitate my 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 late husband Leon Trotsky and his son uh, Leon Sedov. So he recognized it immediately that uh, that that uh, the similarity between Khrushchev's attack on Stalin and Trotsky's attacks on Stalin. Of course, Khrushchev never never acknowledged that he never rehabilitated Trotsky. That. But it gave. As a result, it gave the Trotskyist movement a tremendous shot in the arm. And in one of my books, uh, I quote David North, who is a, a leading Trotskyist here in the United States. And in one of his books, he says, and the book is named In Defense of Leon Trotsky, David North says that uh, he acknowledges that Khrushchev's secret speech was, uh, was a, 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 tremendous, a tremendous boost to the Trotskyist movement. And, uh, and of course, the Trotskyist movement has been continuing to exist parasitically on the uh, anti-communist statements coming out of the Soviet Union and then crossed during, during Khrushchev's time and then during Gorbachev's time and also on the anti-communist claims made by Western scholars, uh, none of which are supported by evidence, but they still repeat them and, uh, and they still do. So, um, so I knew that sooner or later, after rewriting Khrushchev Live and uh, doing a few other things, I knew that sooner or later I'd have to turn to Trotsky. Because if what Khrushchev was saying was a lie, then didn't that imply that what Trotsky was saying was a lie? But let's investigate it. And in the first part of that book, Trotsky's Amalgams, I discuss um, some of Trotsky's writings in the 1930s, which are easily available. And I discovered that it is possible to prove, easily possible to prove, that Trotsky was lying about the Soviet Union, about Stalin, uh, at that time. And you can do this without having to read Soviet documents from the Soviet archives. Uh, you can do it just by comparing what Trotsky said at one time to what Trotsky said at a different time, or what Trotsky said that he was reading in an article in Pravda or an article in the French Communist Party, Libre Vite, versus what was really in those articles, which are, which are easily available. Uh, and he was lying even then. And so in the first part of that book, I showed that uh, three or four chapters that uh, Trotsky lied uh, even uh, even in cases where if anybody had bothered to check up to go and verify what he was saying, uh, his lies could have been discovered. Uh, but evidently they never were, or at least I've never seen that. I've never seen them in print. I've never seen them in print. So Trotsky lied to to an extent that's almost almost incredible. Well, he thought he could get away with it. But of course he did get away with it, so he was right. All right, and he evidently made the calculation that nobody was going to call on these lies, and, and nobody did. Um, well, then there's the question of what 
now that we have the documents from the former Soviet archives, um, were further lied by Trotsky can be proved. But before I came to, to do that, um, okay, that, the, uh, the Trotsky archive at Harvard University was open to researchers on January 1980. And the first team of researchers to go in there and, and work on it, to work on the Trotsky archive that, that Harvard had bought from Leon Trotsky back in the 1980s. Um, was a team of graduate students, I think, for the most part, and uh, led by a French professor named Pierre Brouet, who's now long dead, but in his day at that time was the leading Trotskyist historian, leading Trotskyist scholar in the world. And he had his own journal called uh, Cahier Leon Trotsky, Leon Trotsky Notebook. Um, it stopped publishing when he died, but it published 40 or 50 issues. Uh, and almost immediately, in 1980, the same year, uh, he published an article, Brouet published an article in French, in this journal of his, showing that um, there's evidence in the Trotsky archives that Trotsky lied. Trotsky did form a block with the right, uh, the Trotskyists and the right did form a block, a secret clandestine block, political block, as in unity in the Soviet Union. Uh, and try, that was one of the accusations in the Moscow trials, uh, in 36 and 37 and 38 Moscow trials. The Trotsky had always denied this, and the Trotskyist movement had always denied that Pierre Brule showed that it was true. Trotsky did form a, a, such a block, and the documents were in the Trotsky archive. So, and then a few years later, um, Arch Getty, who was an American historian, did some research in the Trotsky archive, and he discovered some more lies that Trotsky committed, had evidence in the Soviet archives that Trotsky committed. So, so, you know, I wrote a chapter or two in that book, Trotsky's Amalgams, about that as well. And once again, this is proving that Trotsky lied um, through evidence from his own archives. You know, you can't say that the Soviet slandering him here or anything like that. Then it was time to turn to uh, what the uh, documents from the former Soviet archives reveal about Trotsky. And of course we can show lots more lies, did lots more devious stuff. But uh, it's important to realize that uh, that there's this ground groundwork done, that there's this basis uh, of showing that Trotsky lied a great deal uh, using documents either from his own archive or just from his own writings, so that it's for sure that Trotsky was lying a great deal. And I wrote several other books uh, summarizing the evidence uh, that he collaborated with the Germans and Japanese and with the fascist forces within the Soviet Union, and of course also with his own ground conspirators, collaborated, conspired to um, sabotage Soviet industry, uh, to assassinate certain Soviet leaders, uh, as well as this collaboration with Germany and Japan. So I think that that's, uh, that's uh, important stuff. Um, and, it, and the reason I started doing it is because of the similarity between Khrushchev's allegations against Stalin and Trotsky's allegations. Well, that's fascinating. On the on the topic of of Trotsky lies, I think that uh, presents mm -hmm. a good segue to your recent book. I'm going to pull mm -hmm. it up here. Um, yeah. Is is there anything that you'd like to uh, th that you'd be able to tell us about uh, the Testament of Lenin? Um, sure. What's fraudulent in it? Because this is a this is one of the big pieces that's pulled up uh, by by Trotskyites or, or, or critics yeah. of Stalin. Yes, uh, that's right. Uh, well, okay, sure. Um, uh, Lenin got very sick in 1922, uh, and after night after 
after December, some point in mid-December 1922, he couldn't, he couldn't write anymore, he had to dictate. Uh, and during the, the period 22, December 22 to March 23, he, uh, or it is, it has been believed that he wrote a number of articles, which were published at the time. Uh, and um, after the end of the Soviet Union, a Russian historian, uh, Valentin Sakharov, who is still alive, I've been in touch with him, uh, got access, because he was a professor at Moscow State University, got access, got extensive access, though not total access, to documents from Lenin's um, archive, okay, original documents. And he discovered that there were serious problems with some of these uh, archive, with some of these documents. Um, signs of forgery with some of them, uh, uh, contradictions between uh, the historical record on the one hand and what, and what some of these documents were stated on the other, uh, all kinds of problems with, with some of these documents, like serious problems with the diary of the Lenin's uh, secretariat, the secretaries who, who were supposedly keeping a, a log or a diary of all uh, these activities every day. So the problems with that work show that it was uh, manipulated in various ways. And Sakharov wrote his PhD dissertation in the late 1990s, and then in 2003 he published a 700 page book uh, at Moscow University Press in which he expounded his view with evidence that the so-called Testament of Lenin was a, uh, was a fraud. Now, what's called the Testament of Lenin is uh, different sources give different, a different list, so different list of documents. So some of these last documents of Lenin written between, or allegedly written between December 1922 and March 1923, um, appear to be genuine. They, they uh, correspond with Lenin's uh, ideas, uh, ideas that he had expressed uh, beforehand. Uh, uh, others, however, uh, are sharply critical of Stalin. And uh, since the 1920s, um, they've been accepted as genuine. Uh, it, it, in the, a couple of the party congresses after Lenin's death, when they were made available to the Central Committee members, um, some of the people who spoke about them said, well, you know, Lenin was sick. These, these documents, which attack Stalin, are, are, are just not accurate. They don't reflect his real views, uh, and that his criticism of Stalin hasn't been borne out. Uh, okay, uh, fast forward to Khrushchev and immediately after Khrushchev's speech, and in fact, during Khrushchev's speech, Khrushchev quoted a number of these documents showing that, uh, which alleged to show that Lenin wanted Stalin to be removed as the party chairman, and then even threatened to break off relations with him um, over, a, over insults that he allegedly had hurled at, at, at Lenin's wife, Krupskaya. Okay. Um, Sakharov wrote this 700-page book, and he demonstrates with a lot of logic and a lot of evidence that the anti-Stalin documents of, among these last writings of Lenin, those documents that are often called Lenin's political testament, uh, are not genuine. Okay. I When this book came out in 2003, 2004, I sort of looked over it, I sort of skimmed it, it's 700 pages long, and I said, well, you know, someday I'll come back and look at this, but I don't have time to do this now. Um, about eight years ago, I guess, I read uh, very carefully uh, the first volume of Stephen Kotkin's a projected three-volume biography of Stalin. Stephen Kotkin is a professor at Princeton University and a, uh, a specialist in the Stalin period, which he's studied his whole professional life. 
He's also a fellow of the Huda Institution. You know, he's extremely anti-Stalin. He's extremely anti-communist. Very pro-capitalist. But but a capable guy. And in that first volume, which takes Stalin from Stalin's birth, 1878 to 1929, um, Kotkin discusses Sakharov's book. And it's clear that Kotkin thinks that Sakharov is right. Sakharov is right that that uh, that these documents, these purportedly by Lenin uh, attacking Stalin, uh, uh, simply can't can't be genuine. Well, that was a shocker to the anti-communist world and a real shocker to the Trotskyists because these documents had always been just accepted as Khrushchev accepted them, as Gorbachev accepted them, always been accepted as as uh, you know, evidence that Lenin saw that Stalin was really an evil guy, or about to become an evil guy, and, and uh, that Trotsky was the real, the real successor to Lenin, and, and this kind of stuff. And here was was Kotkin saying that these same anti-Stalin documents of Lenin's were false, were, were frauds. Uh, why would a, a card-carrying fire-breathing anti-communist like Kotkin say that unless he thought it was true. And Kotkin makes a good argument. He, he studied Sakharov very carefully. So when I read that, I realized that it was time for me to go back and study Sakharov's book. And once I read it, 700 pages, a very dense argumentation in Russian, I, it occurred to me that if I didn't Write a book about this, trying to make Sakharov's discoveries more accessible to uh, an English uh, reading audience. Probably no one would, and therefore this very important discovery by Sakharov would go uh, largely ignored. So I sat down to do this, and it took me three years to do it. It was a big, big job, but um, I. Summarized and reorganized Sakharov's somewhat sprawling, although really very brilliant book, uh, and summarized his arguments and reviewed them, gave the evidence for them. In one or two cases, I disagreed with the, some of the secondary things that he said. Uh, and, uh, and then also in that book, discussed some other related issues like Trotsky's dishonest use of the Lenin's so-called testament, um, the dishonest use of it by uh, a now deceased uh, Soviet uh, scholar of the Soviet Union named Moshe Lewin. Um, I have a chapter on Lenin's wife Krupskaya, who is unquestionably um, responsible for some of the fraudulent documents. She clearly was 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 falsifying some of these documents, and of course I give it all. I get, I get the evidence. So um, that's important because it makes uh, makes Sakharov's discovery available to a wide audience, uh, and it uh, demolishes uh, the claim made by Trotskyists ever since Trotsky himself that Lenin really turned toward Trotsky uh, towards the end of his own life, turned towards Trotsky as his um, as his successor, he wanted Trotsky to succeed him, not Stalin, and it, it really demolishes that that uh, that argument. Oh, and I have a chapter in there about yeah, I, I mentioned that I have a chapter in there about Trotsky's uh, dishonest use of, of these documents too. So, so I think it's a, I think it's important um, insofar as people are interested in Lenin's works. And, and in so far as these these last writings of Dr. of Lenin, often called the Testament, uh, have puzzled many people for years. The so the ones that are anti-Stalin seem so discordant, seem to so uh, contradict so much of what Lenin had written uh, earlier that um, that they've been they've puzzled people ever since E. H. Carr wrote about. In the first volume of his famous but now you know, 
very, very old, a uh, history of the Russian Revolution. Carr wondered what was going on with these with these documents too. So I think it's uh, it's uh, it's important, and uh, you can expect strong attacks on this book from the Trotskyists because uh, it really cuts the the last bit of the rug from underneath the feet of the Trotskyists who have always contended, like Trotsky contended, that Trotsky was really the the Lenin's chosen heir, and that things would have been so much better in the Soviet Union had Trotsky. Uh, and um, and so it, it it goes along with the the disproving of the allegations of criminal behavior and, uh, and murders and dictatorial, dictatorial actions by Stalin. Now this goes along with that. It kind of accompanies that to show you how how Soviet history in the Stalin period, even this very early period, has been so terribly uh, distorted. We have a, a, a very, a very distorted and incorrect and inaccurate picture of that period and of Stalin himself. Thank you so much for that. Um, again, let me pull it up so that people can see the book. I have shared it on the chat so that everyone can check it out, and we would also have it linked to. Uh, to the both the description of the YouTube video, and then we'll pin it as the first comment on the YouTube right. video, uh, along right. with uh, Professor Fur's website, which uh, in in where you can find uh, his book uh, Khrushchev Lied, Trotsky's mm -hmm. Algums, uh, Stalin Waiting for the Truth, among with his other articles. Um, so I wanted to ask. Uh, I know it's getting late, but. Uh, would you be interested in taking maybe a couple questions uh, that I've collected from the audience? Sure. I'll try to be brief. So let me see if I can find the, the first one that I had selected here. Um, it's from E.G. Egg, Exhort. I, I mm -hmm. guess that's how you pronounce it. But it was a fairly good question because it relates to um, one of the more popular books that Marxist-Leninists engage with to understand uh, the collapse of, uh, or the overthrow of the Soviet Union, which is the uh, Roger Keering, mm -hmm. Thomas Kenny book, Socialism Betrayed. Sure. Let me see if I can find the, uh, it was a while back, so I might not be able to find it. But anyways, the question relates to, oh, here it is. Um, I might expand uh, uh, beyond this. Uh, can you talk a little bit about parallels between Khrushchev and Gorbachev? Can you, uh, perhaps do that um, in relationship to the sort of genealogy that's laid by uh, Kieran and Kenny um, concerning the right wing of the party where they, they trace this uh, Bukharin, Khrushchev, and then uh, um, Gorbachev line. What, what are your thoughts on that? Sure. And by the way, you can remove that that uh, that line there because like, it's too small for me to read. Um, <laughs> Well, so are you asking me about Kieran and Kenny? Uh, Kieran and Kenny have a lot of good things in their book. Um, they gesture towards saying that uh, the rot started with Khrushchev, but um, uh, they don't come down strongly on that side. I think this probably has to do with the political environment that they were working on when they were writing that book back in the late 90s, the beginnings of the uh, 2000s. Uh, you know, the Communist Party USA, where they were certainly very active, uh, was uh, pro Khrushchev. And uh, the leaders of the Communist Party USA during that period of time were as well. So uh, to, to say that, uh, that everything really went off the rails very clearly uh, at, in Khrushchev's time uh, would, sort of, would, in a way, be negating uh, the. Uh, the uh, political line of the Communist Party in the USA and the pro, not pro Christian, but pro Moscow Communist movement. But for whatever reason, they don't come down strongly, uh, as strongly as I do, let's say, to say that, uh, that uh, Soviet socialism was doomed. Uh, you could see it was doomed once, it stopped, once Stalin died. Also, uh, they wrote that book before Khrushchev Lied came out. Now, when, when I before I was either before or right after I published Khrushchev Lied, 
um, uh, I sent a copy to Roger Kieran, and uh, he was very, very positive about it. I mean, I, it would be, I don't want to quote exactly what he said, but it would be impossible, it'd be impossible to imagine that he could have been more, more positive. He thought it was an unshaken book. Uh, then a few months later, he wrote a very critical review of it in uh, ML Today. Um, and I responded to that. And I thought the review was that he wrote was interesting. First of all, it was it was not well informed uh, and made lots of false statements, which fortunately they allowed me to respond to and correct. Um, but secondly, it contradicted what he had told me just a few months beforehand. You know that, uh, and so he clearly he felt some sort of tension, you know, perhaps between. Uh, what he and his comrades had thought for many, many years, and what I was now saying. Um, I, I think that Kieran and Kennedy's, Kennedy's book has a lot of a lot of important facts. Uh, if I if I were going to criticize it, I would say that uh, uh, he he doesn't it doesn't describe uh, or it doesn't fully enough describe the fact that the Soviet Union was basically heading toward capitalism uh, ever since Khrushchev's day. Much less does it go back and investigate the roots of where Khrushchev came from, because Khrushchev was a major Soviet figure, right? Major, major, he was the Politburo during Stalin's time, a major Soviet leader. So if Khrushchev had all these bad ideas, and Khrushchev supporters did, and clearly they did, that all happened during the period of Stalin's leadership. So there must have been something going on during the period of Stalin's leadership, too. And we need to investigate that. That needs to be scrutinized. We can't just leave it at you know, on the level of, uh, of individuals, like Stalin was good, but Khrushchev was bad. But that, that, isn't, that doesn't really explain anything. We need to look at the roots of why the Soviet Union uh, went off the tracks, so to speak, and started to move back towards, towards the capitalism. And, uh, you know, I have some ideas about that, but that's not the current question. Um, that all, all that having been said, Kieran Kenny's book is is well worth reading. Great. Uh, there was a there was a there was a question that was related to that about mm -hmm. Andropov. Um, but I, yeah. I uh, yeah. what are your thoughts on on Andropov? Because uh, he he's looked at quite favorably by. Yeah. Uh, Kieran and Kenny, and there was yeah. a CIA uh, official that mentioned that had Andropov been younger when he took office, the Soviet Union would have still been around or something. What are your well, thoughts? Well, it might be, yeah. I mean, I just said what I... If it's the case, as I just finished claiming, that uh, the Soviet capitalism was was destined to swallow up the Soviet Union, the Soviet Union was, de was destined to develop towards capitalism uh, once Khrushchev came about, uh, was Khrushchev he came to power, and that maybe the roots and the, the roots of it must go back even further than that, because after all, Khrushchev came from someplace. Uh, then, you know, then you can approach what they say about Andropov. I think there's a lot of wishful thinking that if somehow or rather the Soviet Union, the ship of the Soviet ship, could have been turned around and, and pointed in the right direction, uh, except that Andropov died and. Gorbachev came to power. Um, I don't think that's the case, but it might conceivably be the case that, well, certainly something would have been different. Uh, perhaps the Soviet Union uh, as a state would have lasted somewhat longer. Maybe, could be, possibly. Um, but, but the Soviet Union was, um, and Kieran and Kenny don't seem to fully grasp this, although they they certainly hint at it. The Soviet Union was, was was basically doomed long before Andropov came to power. So the idea that Andropov could suddenly, suddenly have resolved all of these terrible contradictions and, and, and problems uh, and, and the change in the political line of the, of the communist movement in a radically different direction um, seems, seems doubtful. 
I don't see how that could be true. Very well. Uh, I'm trying to look here for a question that was made by Todd. I'm looking was, for it too. <laughs> it was a good, good question. One. It's a shame that StreamYard doesn't let you just like save some comments for, for later on. Oh, found it. Okay. Okay. Um, we can make this the last one then, if that sounds good for sure. um, for you guys. Sure. Um, how was it that Khrushchev succeeded Stalin? Was he a trusted lieutenant mm -hmm. of Stalin's? It's like that's a good question, Todd. How is it that Khrushchev came to power? Right. Well, I mean, that's that's pretty well documented. The um, the bourgeois experts have explained that pretty well. Um, uh, I mean, at least to some extent. Okay, so around Stalin's deathbed, the, um, the the people who were in the old polit the old Politburo, which had been at the Central Committee meeting of October fifty two after the nineteenth Party Congress, been renamed the Presidium, um, came around stood around Stalin's deathbed essentially. There were seven or eight of them. Uh, uh, and basically reconstituted what had been up to that time, the up to up to October fifty two, the old Politburo. Uh, that's what I meant. That's what I mean when I say that they uh, ignored or trashed the decisions of the uh, of the uh, October fifty two um, Central Committee meeting, because the October fifty two Central Committee meeting had replaced the smaller group called the Politburo was a much larger group called the Presidium. It was over 30 members. And that never met again after Stalin's death. So then you had a handful of people. Uh, you had uh, the people who became well known for being Stalinist, Malenkov, Molotov, Gaganovich, Voroshilov, uh, one or two others, and you had Khrushchev. Um, of the people that I mentioned, only Khrushchev had recently been a um, a, uh, a party leader of, of uh, in, in a, an important area of the Soviet Union. All the others were involved in in uh, uh, in Moscow positions and in, in executive positions in Moscow. They didn't really have a base of their own. Khrushchev clearly did. In the 30s, he had been the head of the Moscow party, and then he had been appointed the head of the party in Ukraine. Uh, I think it's uh, it has to be the case that the party leaders in the major areas of the Soviet Union um, had been in touch with each other, had had a kind of collaboration with one another, because this was Khrushchev's base within the party. Uh, the people who were around Stalin, Molokov, Malenkov, Kaganovich, uh, Voroshilov, had no base uh, among the leadership of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. They were people who worked in the Moscow leadership, Moscow direct uh, leadership of the party, and they were, they were Stalin's the closest uh, advisors. But they had no political base. Khrushchev had a big political base, and he was in touch with the, uh, with the party leaders around the country. Um, within a fairly short period of time, um, Molotov, Malenkov, Kaganovich tried to get rid of Khrushchev. Uh, that was in early 57, just a year after Khrushchev's speech. Uh, there was an interesting kind of uh, struggle. Uh, they were unsuccessful. Khrushchev called an emergency central committee meeting. Uh, he had the uh, army, uh, perhaps commanded by Marshal Zhukov, fly the central committee meeting members to Moscow, and the central committee deposed the old Stalinists and confirmed Khrushchev's position in leadership. And that's well documented. I mean, that's nothing that I discovered. That's, that's, that's well known. But what it suggests 
is that Khrushchev had a big base among the uh, the people who really had a political base among the leaders of the Communist Party, that is, the first secretaries in all the different areas of the country. So I believe that's how they came to power. We also have a, some, some documentation of discussions that took place among this small leadership before Khrushchev gave the secret speech. And it's clear that Molotov, Malenkov, Kaganovich, uh, and one or two others were not happy with the idea of denouncing Stalin, of criticizing Stalin. But they went along with it for a period of time, clearly out of the desire to be, you know, you know, follow democratic centralism. You get outvoted, you, you go and fuck the party leadership. But that didn't last very long. Molotov wrote a very long and detailed letter in the early 1960s after the 22nd Party Congress, which took place on October 1961, uh, and during which time Khrushchev's men attacked Stalin much more severely, much more sharply than they had than Khrushchev had done in 1966. Molotov wrote this very long letter criticizing the anti-Stalin turn, criticizing the policies of Khrushchev's policies, criticizing the policies of the Soviet Union was taking as being anti-Leninist and so forth, and he was bounced. He was kicked out of the party for that. That document was pu was published finally ten years ago. It's so long that it was published over the period of about a year or so in a major historical journal. Um, it's an interesting document because it shows that uh, you know whatever his political weaknesses were. Uh, Molotov saw pretty clearly that the Soviet Union was on a, was, had taken a very right wing turn, was on, definitely on the wrong path. And you can see this in the book called Molotov Remembers, which is really an abbreviated version of, uh, of a Russian book of Molotov's uh, interviews uh, by a, a guy named Felix Chuyev, uh, who interviewed Molotov over a period of about 25 years. Uh, Molotov was very dismissive of Khrushchev, really thought that Khrushchev was, was uh, no Marxist, okay, to put it mildly. So, yeah, uh, that was not available when Curie and Kenny were writing their book, of course, but it's perfectly clear that, uh, that there were people in the Soviet Union, not just in China, but in the Soviet Union, who recognized that uh, Khrushchev was leading the country sharply away from the development towards socialism. That's fascinating. Uh, this has been a very illuminating conversation uh, uh, for us. Uh, thank you again for coming on. It's been uh, fascinating. And uh, I mean, we could sit here and ask you a million questions, but um, we won't uh, treat your time like that. Um, maybe, another, maybe another time. Another time. Definitely. We hope definitely. to have you back. I'd love to have you back on. So uh, thank you again uh, for, you. for interviewing with us. And thank you all who watched. Uh, this has been an interview with Professor Grover Fur debunking the lies that hold up a lot of the anti-socialist sentiments in the West uh, and around the world. So uh, thanks again for coming on. Thank you. Bye-bye. See you all.